Yes. And the xiphoid process is just the bottom part of the sternum. So you want to get your hands, interlock your fingers, you're going to use the, the palm or the base of the palm of your hand, get your shoulders on top of the victim, and just press deep and fast. The goal is to get between 100 and 120 compressions in a minute. You can sing the song Staying Alive. You can sing to that beat. You can sing Staying Alive. That will keep you in the right beat. You can also sing uh, Baby Shark. Um, there's actually a list of about 15 to 20 different songs that you can download. There's a bunch of apps that you can download, and it will actually give you a beat to let you know every time you give a compression. If you go too fast, if you're compressing too fast, you're actually not allowing the heart time to refill. If you don't press deep enough, you can't squeeze the heart down because your goal is to push the rib cage all the way to the back of the spine and compress the heart and pump blood out. Don't be afraid to break ribs unless you're just a really big person and you have a really small victim, you're probably not gonna break ribs. So you just wanna compress deep and the goal for an adult is about two inches. It's hard to measure two inches, so just press deep and fast. So with an adult, you're going to give 30 compressions, and you're going to count out loud, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. If you're doing mouth to mouth, you would actually open the chin, pinch the nose, and you would give a breath until you see the chest rise. If you're out in public, the American Heart actually now recommends you don't have to worry about doing the breathing because one, you don't know putting your mouth directly on that victim's mouth is you can get cross-contamination. There's a possibility that the victim's gonna vomit or they will have already vomited. So they actually recommend that uh, you don't have to do breathing. When you do a compression, every time you come up on the chest, you're actually pulling enough air into the victim's lungs that it will keep them oxygenated until the paramedics or the EMTs can get there with an oxygen mask. But if you're preparing for the American Heart test, it's 30 compressions to two breaths. For, for today's purpose and in real life, if I found a victim outside in the public, I would just do chest compressions only. And again, you just want to do 100 to 120 in a minute. If you get tired, you want to ask somebody to help and take over. That's the adult uh, chest compressions. The best thing that's going to help a victim is to get an EMT or somebody there with an AED. And an AED is just an automatic external defibrillator. So as soon as you find a victim unresponsive, hey, hey, are you okay? No pulse. You know they're unresponsive and they need CPR. So if there's a group of people with you, you want to identify them. Hey, Johnny, call 911. Hey, Susie, please go get the AED. Because if you just say, hey, somebody go get the AED, it'd be like me asking you, hey, somebody call and order me a pizza. Well, who's going to do it? Either everybody's going to do it or nobody's going to do it. So you want to make eye contact and call them by name. And then make sure they close that loop. One of the terms you'll hear in your medical future medical training is closed loop communication. Johnny, call 911. And Johnny responds, okay, I'm calling 911. Susie, go get the AED. Susie responds, I'm on my way to get the AED now. And that way you know that someone is taking care of what you need. So the AED is really simple to use. It's designed for the general public. You push the button to turn it on. Apply pads to patient's bare chest. And then Plug in you, pads connector next to flashing light. So you turn the machine on and they're all designed in the same way the button may be in a different area, but you turn the machine on and then you follow the instructions of the machine. This machine said to apply the pads to the victim's chest. So you have to take your clothes off and you want to see their bare skin. 
if it's a man who grew up in the 70s or a woman for that matter just to be politically correct but they have a real hairy chest you may not be able to get the pads to stick really good so a lot of aeds come with two sets of pads if they do you can put one on and then rip the skin off or rip the hair off of the chest if it only comes with one set of pads you can use just a part of the pad you turn it this way you use a part of the pad and rip just enough off the main goal is to make sure the pad touches and directly sticks to the skin the other component is it shows you where to put the pads one is going to be on the left side of the chest right across the angle of the ribs and the other pad is going to be on the right side of the chest just under the clavicle or the collarbone. Once you get the pads attached to the patient, and if they're sweaty, so if they're having, if they're truly having a heart attack, there may be a bunch of profuse sweating going on. It's one of the first signs and symptoms of a heart attack is profuse sweating. You'll just take their clothes and wipe them down. If you're at a swimming pool, if you're at a lake, and their body is wet. If you're outside and they're laying in a puddle of water, you just wanna make sure the skin is dried off and the pads are sticking to the victim. So then you'll plug it in. And once you plug it in, it'll tell you- Analyzing the heart rhythm. That it's analyzing the heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. So you wanna make sure the victim's not being moved. You want the victim to be still and make sure you're not touching Shock the Shock advised. So it tells you Charging. that it's shock is advised. So it's a, clear a rhythm that's shockable. And then it'll tell you now. once Ready it's charged, now. I'm clear, you're clear, we're all clear, and you shock the victim. Shock delivered. Now, if you're the one responsible for using the AED, the human body is a conductor of electricity. So if you're touching the victim, when you shock it, it's going to shock you also. If that victim is laying in a puddle of water, yesterday it rained a lot. If there was a big puddle of water and you were standing in that water and you shocked the victim, it could also shock you. If you're at a sporting event, high school football game, and they're on this big aluminum bleacher and you shock the victim here, it's going to shock everybody else down that aluminum bleacher. So when you've got to make sure the scene is clear and everybody is clear. So the AED actually told us it was a shock was advised. So the heart has electrical components of it, your EKG rhythm. Some of them you can actually, if it's in a, a bad rhythm, it will actually shock it and convert it back to a normal electrical activity. If it's not a shockable rhythm, it will tell you shock not advised, continue CPR. And that's when you check for a pulse. So you see a lot of times on TV, it's called flatline or asystole, where there's no rhythm at all, there's no electrical activity. That is not a shockable rhythm. However, the victim still needs chest compression. So if there's no pulse and it's not a shockable rhythm, go ahead and just start CPR. So once you shock the, the patient, the AED is actually going to tell you to start CPR back. And it will give you a beat that keeps you on, on track for 100 compressions in a minute. Begin CPR. And you just start compressions and you match the beat. Now notice. I left the pads on because every two minutes it's going to reanalyze the victim. So there are, are the only times that you can stop CPR is if you're completely, utterly exhausted and you're the only one there. If somebody else shows up, uh, then you can actually let them take over compressions. If the EMTs or the paramedics get there, they will take over for you. Or if a medical director actually pronounces the victim dead, that's the only times you can stop CPR. Now you'll be protected if you start CPR and something happens, as long as you're acting within the scope of your practice, you've called 911, they're telling you to do this. If you crack a rib and something happens, 
you can be sued, but you will be protected under the Good Samaritan Act. Um, now, if you pull out a knife and you try to cut their throat and stick a straw into their throat and breathe for them, if that's not in your scope of practice, you won't be covered under that. So stay within the, the scope of your practice of doing chest compressions and giving rescue breathing if necessary, and then doing what the AED tells you to do. That's basically it for the adult. It's a quick rundown, a quick overview. It takes a lot of practice to, to perfect it. And there's always, even in a, a code situation in a hospital, after we get through, we always debrief and say, what could have happened better? What could we do better? Most of the time it's communication. Communication is the key. Hey, I'm getting tired, I need to stop. Because if I get tired and I'm not pushing deep enough, then it doesn't do my patient or my victim any good for me to do poor compressions. So good communication, knowing your limitations. If I had just had shoulder surgery and I came in and I couldn't do high quality chest compressions, it's not gonna help my victim at all. So I need to let my team know hey, my shoulder is hurting really bad. I can't do chest compressions, but I can run the AED. Or you walk up, hey, I'm CPR certified. I also know what to do. How can I help? So good communication is going to be one of the key components of getting the, the victim uh, back. The other key component is quality chest compressions and get the AED there as soon as possible. That's it for the adult. Mr. King? Uh, could I interrupt you for a minute? Uh, so a few people joined us late. Could you go over the Heimlich maneuver one more time, please? I, I started the recording late too, so if you don't mind. No problem. Thanks. So the universal sign of choking for an adult is they grab their throat. A lot of times they'll point to it or they'll mouth the words, I'm choking. If you hear them make a sound, I'm choking, that means they're partially occluded and you don't need to do the Heimlich maneuver. At that point, you really just kind of want them to take a slow breath in and then cough out. And that way they can try to cough their, their own uh, blockage out. That's with a partial occlusion. If they can't make a noise or if you hear a high-pitched shrill sound, then they're completely occluded and you need to help. So if the victim, the first thing you want to do is ask them to pick their arms up like this. It opens up their thoracic cavity, it gives you better arm placement, and it, it gives them more lung expansion. So you find their umbilicus, which is a fancy word for belly button. Put your hand just above the belly button. You're going to squeeze in and pull up. And what you're trying to do is get your hand under the diaphragm and push the diaphragm up. When you do that, when you push the diaphragm up, it squeezes the chest and it acts like a cough. So you'll do the Heimlich maneuver until the victim, until it becomes dislodged and they can speak, or if they pass out. If they become unresponsive, and that's what we didn't cover, so thank you, Dr. Manish, you slowly lay the patient down and then you start CPR. So, the only difference is when you get through with 30, before you give a breath, you want to look into their mouth. We don't do a blind finger sweep anymore. If you stick your, your fingers into a victim's mouth, they actually might bite down on it and can do a lot of damage to your fingers. So no blind finger sweeps. If you see something, you can reach in there and pull it out and hopefully dislodge uh, the food particle or whatever it was they were choking on. Any other questions? You can unmute yourselves or put a question in the chat, whichever you prefer. If you have a question. All right, so that's the adult. Now, let's talk about the infant. And according to the American Heart, the infant is uh, from birth to one years old. The bigger question is how big is the child and, and how big are you? I'll use uh, my cousin when uh, they had their baby. Their son came out at 23 inches and 12 pounds and 14 ounces. 
So if if you're a small individual, by the time he was six months old, he was he was really big. So you might not be able to hold the baby. So a lot of it is how big your arms are and how big the baby is. But really, American Heart is zero to one year. <clears throat> if, a, if a baby starts to choke, they're not going to make the universal sound. But their lips turn really blue. They start gasping for breath. Their eyes get really big. And you can actually see their chest wall sink in because they're trying to suck in so hard that they can't get their air in. So the first thing you want to do with an infant, for always, always stabilize the head. Babies can't control their own head, so always stabilize their head. So you want to pick it up, look in the baby's mouth, and see if you see anything. If you can see it, you can reach in and pull it out. But don't do a blind finger sweep because you're more likely to push it down farther into their throat, and then it, become, it becomes lodged even deeper. So with an infant, you don't see anything, you know they're choking, protect the head but don't cover the mouth, roll them over, we're gonna use gravity. And the other thing is you wanna make sure the scene is safe. If you're at a restaurant and you pick the baby up and you do the helmet maneuver right by the, or the back blows right by the table and you hit their head on the table, you've now caused another problem. So you pick them up, check their mouth, support their head, use gravity. And you're going to do five back blows or back slaps. If the baby is larger than you, you can actually sit down. You can actually sit down and use your leg as leverage. What you don't want to do, you don't want to dribble the baby. So you want to hold the baby still, five back blows, support the head, roll them back over, with two fingers between the nipples, you're gonna do five chest compressions. Look in the mouth, see if you can see something. If you can't, you just continue the maneuver. If you see it, you can pull it out. And again, you continue, you continue the back flow and the chest compressions five and five until it becomes dislodged or the baby becomes unresponsive. If the baby becomes unresponsive, you start the steps of CPR. So with an infant, with an adult, we check a carotid pulse. With an infant, we check a brachial pulse, and it's just on the inside of their bicep. If you can't feel a pulse, you immediately start seat compressions. And it's two fingers, in the uh, mid nipple area line in the center of the chest. If you're having trouble, if your fingers aren't strong enough, you can use three. You can actually, some people will like to use one hand, but the problem is that your hand is probably going to be too big for their chest. You can lay the patient, the victim down and use two hands, but you're only using your two fingers in the middle of the chest. So this is chest compressions for an infant. If you're, if the advantage of an infant, if you're large or the baby is smaller than you, you wanna get help there again as soon as possible. So you can start compressions and then you could actually walk to the neighbor's house or you could walk to the office next door. You could go find some help while you're doing CPR. If you're gonna give the breath, you put your mouth over their mouth and nose, and you really just want to puff from your cheek. And it, again, it's just enough to see the chest rise. If you get two people and one other person comes to help, one person will support the baby and hold the head and they can do the breathing for you while you're doing chest compressions. And you can use your thumbs at this point to do the chest compressions. Again, with an infant, you want to compress about an inch and a half or, or a third of the chest. Again, it's just compressed deep. Uh, you don't want to use your full hand because you will push too hard on an infant. And that's basically it for infant CPR. The AED is not recommended for infants. If you work at Children's Hospital or work in a neonatal intensive care, that we, you actually can use them there. But the AED is not 
uh, recommended for use on an infant. Any questions? Any thoughts? So, yeah, we have uh, Augustus. Do you want to ask your question? Then Jandalin. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, he was asking if uh, you've ever had to do that in a public setting. Uh, I've never had to do chest compressions. I've had to do the hammock maneuver. I was up hiring a slow pitch softball game one night and a guy ran into the dugout and started choking and then grabbed his throat. So I had to go, I've done the hammock maneuver. I've never done CPR in the public setting though. And Jandalyn, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I think yes. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I think I have you had answered my question, but I was basically asking how often you have to get um, re CPR certified because I got CPR certified in high school when I was doing athletics, but I'm sure that it's not valid anymore. Your CPR certification is good for two years. Okay. And I. Right now, the American Heart has actually extended that. So you've got, uh, because of all the, the quarantine, nobody could hold a live in-person class. And, and I'll be honest with you, there are some online classes. I don't think they do as good of a job because you don't actually get to put your hands on a mannequin and see what it feels like. These mannequins, we, we say you should never do more than two minutes of compressions without getting help. And people are like, oh yeah, I can do two minutes. You come in here and you start compressing on a mannequin and you're like, how much longer? And you've only been going for a minute. So you really, if you're gonna take a CPR class, I highly recommend you go find a fire station, uh, somebody with a mannequin that you can actually do uh, practice compressions on. But yeah, your certification is good for two years. Any and, other questions? Well, I was going to say, this is called BLS or basic life support. I think in your ship out uh, online program, you've got a video and a book for ACLS. That's called advanced cardiac life support. That has more to do with in hospitals where you can actually push medications, where you analyze the rhythm yourself and you decide if it's shockable enough and you know how much how much energy or how many joules to shock the patient with. Uh, so when you, if you enter or when you enter the medical field, get your credential, get a job. I highly recommend everybody who's eligible to become ACLS certified because the more information you have when you go into a code, the better the outcomes are, so. Yeah, that was my mistake. I, um, I put up the ACLS instead of BCLS. Uh, so Daniel, uh, Daniel, yeah, that's a great point. And what we talked about was don't waste a lot of time. I told you to go practice and it's hard enough to find on somebody who is awake and alert unless you've had a lot of practice for it. So yes, the, I, I told you try to find one really quick, but don't spend a whole lot of time. Uh, so shake and shout. Yes. Shake, 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 shout just as loud as you can. And and honestly, you have to be aggressive there. It's not like, hey, are you awake? Are you okay? You have to shake them and try to wake them up. But yeah, that's a great point. Don't spend a whole lot of time pushing your fingers around and being worried about if they've got a pulse or not. If they don't wake up and you can't find one really quick within two or three seconds, go ahead and start compressions. What's the worst that could happen? They were really in a deep sleep. You start compressions, they wake up, and hey, you got you did your job. You got them back, right? All right, that's supposed to be a joke. You should laugh and nod your head there. Any other questions or um, I have a question. Um, what would you recommend for people who kind of have like noodly weak arms? <laughs> Go to the weight room and drink some milk. No, um, so that's a great question. And it goes back to uh, the other chat question was about the hammock maneuver. Where you put your, where you put your hand. What if this person was obese? What if this person was six foot five and you're only five foot tall? 
can you really get your arms all the way around them? No, you can't. What if they were, what if it was a lady and she was nine and a half months pregnant? Uh, could you get your hands around uh, the, their abdomen to find their umbilical or their umbilicus? So the correct hand placement is you find their belly button and you want to go just above it, but make sure you're not on their ribs. So there's a space about like that between a real victim. You can get your hand just above the belly button, but not on the rib cage. So you can squeeze in under the ribs and then push up. So if you're doing chest compressions and you're getting tired, if you're the only one there, you have to make that decision. You have to make that call. Am I strong enough to keep doing it? If you don't do anything, the victim's not going to make it. Okay. There's a, a if you start, you know, and you're starting to get tired and you know you're getting tired, you just sometimes you just have to tell yourself, I can do this for a few more minutes. The EMTs are almost there. Uh, if you're by yourself, pull your phone out and dial 911. And then you'll have the operator, the 911 operator talking to you, and they'll walk you through all the steps. Hey, keep going, push harder. Paramedics are two minutes away from there. Well, you hear that, oh yeah, I can last another two minutes. Uh, but Emily, that is a very, you know, it's a difficult situation. If you're standing there and you don't do anything, the victim's more than likely not gonna make it. If you start, you might buy them enough time or you might get enough oxygen to their brain until the paramedics can get there and then they can take over. Uh, I have a question. So, yep. so in a real life scenario, I was at a restaurant and somebody started choking, but it was like a big guy. And I noticed that everyone in the restaurant was trying to do CPR and chest compressions, but because of all the fat on the body, they couldn't like, do a, I guess, a thorough job, or they weren't sure what to do. So I was wondering, in a, in a case scenario like that, what do you, what do you do? Because I think they're having problems like getting their hands all the way through, or getting their arms around them, or just trying to locate the area. So what do you do in that kind of scenario? Great question. And it also goes back to the pregnant woman. If if the woman is early pregnant and you can get your hand above the baby but below the ribs, you can still do the Heimlich maneuver. If you can't, or if they're so obese, you can't get your hands around them, you lay them on the ground and you do chest compressions, okay? So they're not as effective because when you push down, you're gonna push the diaphragm out a little bit. But when you're doing chest compressions, even on this mannequin, when you do a good, I can actually see the plastic on the mouth moving as it's pushing air out of the mouth. So if they're so obese, or if they're too tall, you know, if you have to do this to get your hands to their belly button, then they're too tall. You can't squeeze in and up. If you're not strong enough to do the high maneuver, just lay them down. You can usually get your full body weight on top of them and then push down on to get a good chest compression. If it's choking, hopefully it won't take, you know, five or 10 good compressions to get that food dislodged and pumped up or pushed out. Does that help? Roxana, you're right. Ooh, what's that? Ooh, he needs some milk. No, you just have to get strong. And, and that's something that, that's kind of like if, if you have shoulder surgery, or if you know you're not strong enough to do compressions and you're walking up with a team, tell the team, hey, I know I'm not good at chest compressions. Let me go get the AED. Let me go call 911. And it's all about communication. If you're there by yourself, you just have to start it and, and do your best until help gets there. Great, great point, great question. If you're at home, you're by yourself, uh, you can't do the Heimlich maneuver on yourself right here. 
but you can find a countertop or a, a couch or a, a chair that's not movable and you just actually have to stand back and then throw yourself into it and and use the countertop as somebody else's hands to do the hammer maneuver on yourself. Have we any other questions or are we good? I didn't know that about the countertop, so I learned something new. Uh... Oh, so where are AEDs? That's a great question. If you're at UAB in the School of Health Professions, there's actually one on the second floor. There's one on the sixth floor. There's one in the LRC. No. no, I'm sorry, not the LRC, uh, but their staff knows where they are. There's one, they're everywhere, really. And, and what's funny, if, if you'll start walking around, you'll be in a shopping mall, and all of a sudden on the wall, you'll see a sign that says AED and a, a cabinet right there. You'll start noticing these. A lot of police departments carry them around in their vehicles in the trunk of their, or in the backseat of their car, so they can have one on site. Uh, wherever you go to school, start looking around. Uh, the problem with them is they're expensive. When they were first kind of designed, it was thought that, you know, there would be one in every neighborhood or everybody would have one, but they're about $1,500 and up, uh, depending on what model you get. Uh, so they're not really accessible to the lay public yet, but uh, grocery stores have them, shopping centers have them, courtrooms have them, airports have them, uh, police departments have them. They're, they're really everywhere. Gymnasiums have them. Oh, and that's the one thing. When, when we get off the Zoom, Google or look up Atlanta volleyball player CPR. And there's a story about a girl named Claire. She's a senior at a high school in the outskirts of Atlanta. And in the middle of her senior volleyball night, volleyball game, so this is old school. Her dad had set the video camera up on the stage and he was recording it. He was down there by the scorer's table, but she serves the volleyball and then you see her. She kind of staggers and then she grabs her chest and she falls back and collapses in the middle of a volleyball game. The Training staff, the coaches, the principal, they run, get the AED, they start CPR, and they actually shock her, and they have her sitting up in a wait before the paramedic can ever get there. So that is a great, great story of how it works, how it helps uh, in training. So schools should have them. Um, but go watch, go Google uh, Atlanta volleyball player CPR, and it should pull up a story called Claire's story. So Madison, you have a question? Okay, for kids, uh, kids, you really treat them the same like you would an adult. Uh, if they were just barely one, if they were two, uh, it, again, it, it's the hand placement. If your hand is so big, it covers their entire chest, go to two or three fingers. Uh, if they're a six, seven, eight year old and you can get one hand on there, you can actually do one-handed compressions because you don't want to go uh, over two inches. So infants, you want to compress one and a half, children two, and adults two to two and a half. Uh, but other than that, it's still the same rate for everybody. We still want about 100 to 120 compressions for everybody. And that is just to kind of keep it simple. When I first started, there were three different rates, three different depths, three different hand placements. And people wouldn't do anything because they couldn't remember what to do. Now, if I tell you all you have to do is chest compressions and, and compress deep and hard, you can remember 100 to 120. After that, that, that's your goal until help gets there or until another team member comes in and says, hey, I'm CPR certified. We need to do this. And then you just work together as teamwork. No, 
a heart murmur, your AED will actually go through a rhythm. And if it's not a shockable rhythm, VTAC, VFib, then it will tell you shock, not advised. Uh, but if there's no pulse, if you can't get them to wake, you go ahead and you start CPR because they could be in another rhythm that's just not, it, the, the defibrillator is not going to convert it back to a regular rhythm. Which brings up a, 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 another thought. If you pull their clothes off and they have a circle imprinted under their skin, that's probably um, a pacemaker. And all you want to do is you still want to use an AED, but instead of putting it on top of the pacemaker, you just move it around. Because obviously if they've collapsed, the pacemaker is not working right. So you want to use the AED again at that point. If you pull their clothes off and there's medication here, a medication patch, wipe the medication off as good as you can. Don't use your bare hand, use their clothes. Because if it's a fentanyl patch, then that medicine can actually get through absorbing your skin and affect you. If it's a nitroglycerin patch and you shock it, nitroglycerin is a component of TNT, which is a component of dynamite. So it would actually cause up to uh, third degree skin burns and can burn a big hole in their skin. So whatever the, the medication is, just wipe it off as good as you can and then put the AED there on, on top of it. Uh, no, the AED will not necessarily make the pacemaker work again, but the purpose of the pacemaker is to make the heart work again. So the AED will actually make the heart work again, and then that patient or that victim needs to go to the hospital, and they need to reassess the uh, pacemaker function. If you think of a question later on, you thought, oh, I should have asked, just send an email and I'll answer it and Dr. Nichols can post it to the group. Uh, you can send her the email, she'll forward it to me. You're welcome to give them my email address uh, if they want to email me directly. But uh, any question you have about CPR or, or any other hybrid maneuver or anything like that, uh, just let us know and we'll answer them throughout. Okay, if we've got no last questions, um, anybody, any last questions before we break? No? Okay, well, right. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Y'all have a great Kim, We appreciate your time and um, uh, I guess any questions, just pass yeah, them on okay. and we'll, and Shout thanks out. for the, the help in the background too. I'm yeah. sorry I've left on your name. Chris and the Chris, I'm sorry, Chris. Now. Thanks for helping. Appreciate Stop. it. Docs in the background Thank too. We've done a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Before, right. before we let um, him go, can I get a picture? <laughs> can y'all turn y'all's cameras on? <laughs> Jerry, that is hilarious. We need to play the uh, uh, the office CPR scene. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about, but it's I know funny. exactly what you're talking about. Come on, Jandalyn, Lillian, we're waiting on Sindhu. Turn your cameras on. Come on, Chris. Can you zoom your camera in any tighter, Jerry? Yes. Oh, that's too tight, too tight, too tight. Did you say someone else is in the background there, Jerry? No, right there, Turn perfect. I thought you said you had somebody else there with you. If they are, let them. With me or with it. Jerry? No, with Jerry. Yeah, couldn't um, have done it without these guys. And, and they were actually up here Friday making sure everything was ready to go. So extra. Very extra cool. Perfect. All right, y'all. Smile on three, two, one. Hold tight, Jerry. You go. Oh, I see somebody in a mask. All right, Jerry, say something else so you'll show up on this page for me. Go Blazers. I know that's right. Hold tight, smile, three, two, one. 
Got it. One more page. Smile again. Three. Oh, there's a lot of pictures not here. I mean, videos not here on this last page. Three, two, one. Smile. Got it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks You're again. Um, I've recorded this session too, so if you want to review the material, uh, it will be posted later on today. And thanks again, Jerry and Chris. Appreciate your time. Everyone else will be, Group A will be joining Dr. Cinco in just a few moments.